You've probably seen a diagram similar to the one pictured here. The concept of the evolution of man, from a primate walking on all fours to our current bipedal stance. In doing so, our hindquarters have become highly adapted to accommodate this transition. This is a concept that will be explored in this introduction to the lower limb. Good day, and welcome to this installment of the Gross Anatomy video podcast series. Today we begin our journey into the lower limb by looking at the gluteal region, which serves as the anchoring point of the thigh to the pelvis and the transition between the axial skeleton and the lower limb. Before we get into the main topic of today's lecture, we're going to start with a brief overview of the lower limb. Consider the general structure and describe the deep and superficial fascia and superficial neurovascular structures embedded within. This is going to help us to establish a big picture for the discussion over the next four lectures. Think back to the accompanying slide from our first lecture. We demonstrated how the vertebral column accepted the load of the axial skeleton and projected it bilaterally. Today, we'll demonstrate how this load is redirected back towards the midline. It's primarily related to the architecture of the femur. Notice the angle that the neck takes relative to the pelvis and, more importantly, relative to the vertical. So, in effect, we have the axial load dissipated through the hip bones, which serve as a keystone into the femur, which redirects it back towards the midline. The weight is then accepted by the tibia, which has a better orientation relative to the vertical. This arrangement is what allows us to take a bipedal stance. Note that in quadrupeds, as shown on the right, contralateral limbs are generally both on the ground in normal walking. There is therefore less shifting of the center of balance from left to right. In bipedal species, such as humans, there are periods where only one limb is in contact with the ground at a time, serving as the entire base of support. Now, this would result in a lot of lateral shifting back and forth to maintain balance. This redesign places the feet closer to the midline, which reduces lateral shifting of weight and a more efficient gait. Unfortunately, this also places a great deal of strain on the femoral neck due to this redistribution of weight. Consequently, the femoral neck is a commonly site of fractures, particularly in elderly individuals with osteoporosis. Before we dive into individual compartments, we're going to look at the cutaneous structures associated with the lower limb. The lower limb is encased in a layer of thick fibrous fascia. This fascia is much thicker than that found in the upper limb. It acts like a surgical stocking, minimizing the pooling of blood after long periods of standing. The fascia itself can be subdivided based on its location. The fascia of the thigh is referred to as the fascia lata. Laterally, the fascia lata thickens to form the iliotibial band, a ligamentous structure that projects between the lateral surface of the pelvis and knee and serves as an anchor for the gluteus maximus and tensor fascia lata muscles. At its superomedial border, the fascia lata thins dramatically, forming the oval-shaped saphenous opening, which facilitates the venous drainage of cutaneous structures. As we will see later in the lesson, the fascia lata invaginates, forming intermuscular septa that divides the thigh into anterior, medial, and posterior compartments. Below the knee, the crural fascia encases the lower leg. It's thicker than the fascia lata due to its need to support gravitational pull on fluid in the entire lower limb. It again invaginates, dividing the lower leg into anterior, lateral, and posterior compartments. It also thickens to form the flexor and extensor retinacula surrounding the ankle joint. As with the upper limb, a number of cutaneous neurovascular structures are found within the lower limb, including the longest continuous vein in the body, the great saphenous vein. It runs from the medial ankle posterior to the knee and wraps anterior to drain through the saphenous opening, serving as the main venous tributary for the anteromedial leg and most of the thigh. Numerous other veins, most of them unnamed, drain into the great saphenous vein. Because of its size, the great saphenous has traditionally been harvested for coronary bypass surgeries, although with advances in surgical techniques, this is much less common than it used to be. Draining the posterior aspect of the leg is the small saphenous vein. It doesn't enter the thigh as the great saphenous does, but instead dives into the space posterior to the knee, known as the popliteal fossa, to drain into deep venous circulation. We can also identify a number of cutaneous nerves in the superficial fascia of the lower limb. 
Some of these, like the anterior cutaneous nerve, are indirect branches off of other major nerves, in this case the femoral nerve. In other instances, such as the lateral and posterior femoral cutaneous nerves, they are direct branches from the lumbosacral plexus, which will be identified in a later unit. Two particular branches are distinguished in the lower leg. The saphenous nerve is the longest terminal branch of the femoral nerve. It emerges from the anterior compartment of the thigh medially around the level of the knee and runs in close approximation with the great saphenous vein. The sural nerve is found running posteriorly with the small saphenous vein and is formed by the convergence of the medial and lateral sural nerves, which branch from the tibia and common fibular nerves, respectively. As we saw with the upper limb, the cutaneous nerves of the lower limb are distributed in a characteristic fashion, which we'll revisit while discussing the thigh, leg, and foot. Once again, similar to what was seen in the upper limb, an understanding of peripheral nerve distribution and dermatomal pattern will help us to distinguish between nerve root and peripheral neuropathies. We also find an extensive network of lymphatic vessels accompanying venous tributaries in the thigh and leg. The lateral group in the leg accompany the small saphenous vein and typically follow its course through the fascia covering the palpiteal fossa to join deep lymphatic drainage at the knee. The remaining vessels follow the great saphenous vein and are filtered by a collection of superficial sublinguinal lymph nodes surrounding the saphenous opening in the fascia lata. In contrast, the superficial inguinal lymph nodes found medially drain lymph from the pelvic floor and external genitalia. Vessels from the superficial nodes drain through the saphenous opening to join the deep lymphatic vessels draining into the lymphatic cavity. There you have it, a very quick overview of the lower limb, which will be the focus of the next several classes. After the break, we'll take a closer look at the osteology of the pelvis and thigh regions, which will establish the framework for our discussion of the gluteal region. See you then.